Hello everyone, Trophy100, welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today I'm pleased to bring you a review of the Domaine La Flave 2008 Batard Montrachet uh, Grand Cru White Wine. And so this should not be confused with Olivier La Flave's winery, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So Domaine La Flave has a long history in uh, especially Palladian Montrachet. Um, it has origins back to 1717, but um, it really started with the um, kind of the purchase of uh, some vineyards by Joseph Lefebvre in 1905. And so he kind of was responsible for buying up vineyards. He worked with growers. He passed away, I think, in the 1950s and then passed on the management of the uh, vineyard to his son, Vincent Laflave and then also Joe Laflave and it was during that time that it really became known as a top uh, Burgundy producer. So it is basically based in Palini Morche. It does have I think four Grand Cru uh, vineyards and this is one of them and four Premier Cru vineyards. Um, most I think it does I don't think it does red wine at all but so basically known for white wine uh, for white wines and uh, has about 13 acres of uh, Grand Cru vineyards. Under the French inheritance system, um, it goes to the heirs and it, the vineyards get split up and that's one of the problems with Burgundy that uh, when uh, someone passes away, it gets split among their children and uh, all of a sudden you have these very piecework vineyards. Uh, so they actually formed a company to kind of avoid that in 1973. And then in 1990, uh, Vincent's daughter and Claude, along with the cousin, Olivier Laflave, uh, ended up running the, um, uh, the domain. So, uh, and Olivier actually was tasked, this is kind of a side note, uh, in 1984 with uh, doing a negotiant type business for Laflave. So, um, I guess they were getting popular. People asked them to produce wines and he started that arm where they took other grapes from other growers in the region and did the negotiant part of that. So he ran the negotiant business for quite a while. And then in um, 1994, he kind of almost did that full time and he left the um, Le, the Bain Le Flave, uh winery and now became uh, Olivia Leflave. And uh, I guess... Um, he kind of gave them notice that, hey, listen, uh, pursuant to the laws, I should get some of the vineyards. And I think he got those back in 2010. So as a side note, probably Olivia and the Flav wines uh, probably will improve um, after 2010 vintage. And now he's not just a negotiant, but he also owns vineyards. So around 1994, 1997, that's when um, Anne-Claude, Laflave took over the entire management for a while there. She was managing with Olivier and then she passed away in 2015 and now the management of the estate is done by her nephew, which is Bryce de la Morandier. Uh, so he runs it at this point. Very interesting, the name Batard, which I never knew about. Um, so there was the Lord of Poligny. He actually divided his land among three children. The eldest son was a son, so they called it the knight, which is, that's why it's called um, Chevalier Morachet. Then he had a daughters, or daughters, and they were the Pucelles, and so that's why you'll see that uh, Pauline Morachet, there's a region called Pucel. And then the, this part was uh, uh, kind of given to his illegitimate son or bastard, and that's why it's called Batard. And in fact, it's kind of very interesting because actually on the Olivier Laflave and their Domaine Laflave website, you actually, they actually say bastard Montrachet, Montrachet, right? So it's kind of interesting that um, they go back to the origins of the word. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not a good uh, vineyard. It was just given to the illegitimate son. So Batard is actually... Um, it's at the bottom of the hill. So if you look at uh, Marche, the region, the best uh, plots are in the middle. Then you have Chevalier at the top, 
um, and then you have on the two sides Polini and Shashan Marche. Um, so being at the bottom, that means the soil is a bit deeper than other Grand Cru sites. It has um, some limestone and a higher proportion of clay. And so the drainage is probably not as good as higher up in the hill. Uh, but that still doesn't matter because um, the roots still are uh, very deep. And also that limestone, think that people think that that gives that minerally um, characteristic to Batard. So let's talk a little bit specifically about this wine and the vintage. So 2008 wasn't a spectacular vintage for white burgundy. Uh, if this is, again, going back, this is in the Côte de Bon region. Uh, Pauline Marche, mostly known for, or uh, Batard Marche, known, I think, primarily for uh, white wines. I don't think they've produced red wines in Batard. Um, and of course, because it is in um, the uh, Burgundy region, it's 100% Chardonnay. So the 2008 vintage was a decent vintage. It was mild. There was some storms into it, but uh, it wasn't a stellar vintage either. So, but the wines um, actually have survived fairly well. Um, so this wine, again, it's a Batard Morche from the Grand Cru. It doesn't have a, a vineyard site. So this would be a kind of a blend of four different plots within the Batard Marche appellation. Um, the uh, wine spends 12 months in barrel and then another six months in vat. Here is the cork of the wine. So Batard Marche, Domaine Le Flave, and then I guess on the top you'll see the 2008 vintage. Bottle, a very simple 2008 um, Domaine Le Flave from Polini Marche is their kind of the home. And then a couple of things in the back here about the winery in French. The color of the wine, I've turned off the light so it can be a little bit more, uh, this is kind of at, uh, just natural lighting on this wine so you can see the color of it. Um, actually, it looks really nice in person. It's kind of a very um, dark, intense yellow, which is very attractive. Now let's taste the wine and I will let you know I had this last night at a restaurant called Laboratoire. Um, it is a kind of very nice restaurant in the Gastown region in Vancouver. Maybe I'll put the uh, review of that at the end of this video. Uh, and I had paired this with, uh, we had some oysters at the beginning, then we had a nice seafood dish. I think we had lingcod and halibut. Um, so it paired really nicely with it. So we did not decant it. Uh, out of the bottle and I don't know if you can see the color on screen it probably be better on screen right now as compared to when I um, kind of close up on it uh, but you can see the it's a kind of a grain um, uh, yellow really nice color really nice and dark color for 2008 but not doesn't look tired but it's very out of the bottle very attractive color um, on the feel of it in terms of just the the feel in the glass. It's not too heavy, it's not too viscous. And on the aroma, you get um, overripe peaches, some citrus notes, apple, and maybe a touch of a cinnamon spice. Um, you get um, some floral characteristics. Um, the psalm at Laboratoires thought it was hawthorn. I'm not sure what that smells like, um, but lilies, that's something that I could, uh, or acacia, that was something that I could also pick up. Uh, quite aromatic, and uh, with nice uh, white wines, I like to use these kind of bigger glasses, and I like to have them almost at room temperature. So this has been out of the refrigerator now for almost an hour and a bit, warming up in um, room temperature, and I find that that actually gives a little bit more weight to the wines and you can taste them a little better, particularly if they are um, nicer kind of white wines. What's amazing about this wine is it's a 15 year old wine, but lots of still primary fruit on this wine, like um, apple, uh, peaches, apricots, that tanginess is there. I don't see a lot of mineraliness on this wine, but a lot of primary fruit still. So um, 
really delicious, like very tangy in taste. Not a lot of oak on this. Um, really nice drinking wine. Um, if you're looking at value, you don't really get that at higher end Burgundies. Um, for the price, I think this is a fairly expensive bottle uh, for the price. I don't think it's really worth it in that sense um, if you look at value, but it's a beautiful wine. Um, I'm going to rate this. I don't have the wine spectator rating of this wine. I'll probably put it in the comment section. It's a really nice wine. Um, I'm going to rate it 91 points. It doesn't have a lot of complexity from my perspective. It's great. It's nice to drink. It pairs well with food, but I don't get that overall huge complexity. Um, Maybe I'm just not used to white burgundy. I don't understand white burgundy um, yet. But for me, um, I've always had a, a problem kind of figuring out justifying the value of white burgundy. Um, like what's the difference between a $100 white burgundy and a $1,000 white burgundy? To me, it's not that um, noticeable. And that's maybe just in terms of drinking experience, I haven't got the bug yet. I haven't figured it out yet. Yeah, as you drink this, there is a little bit more complexity, like a yeastiness on the aftertaste. Good wine, um, a little bit of residual um, kind of tanginess or grapefruit elements to us, like citrusy on the, on the palate. It's a learning process. Um, I'm not gonna lie that most people will probably not wanna pick up this wine um, just as an easy drink, but it's a really interesting drink. And um, at least the people at the restaurant really enjoyed it. So uh, perhaps they have a little bit more experience or more palate in terms of the enjoyment of the wine. But from my perspective, it's a good wine, uh, but perhaps I need a little bit more um, understanding or experience with drinking white burgundy. Hope you've enjoyed this tasting. Until next time, happy drinking.